Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us again on one of our, uh, another of our Safer at Home programs. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, another sultry day in, uh, in Massachusetts. Um, uh, first and foremost, before, we, before we, I forget, uh, these programs are brought to you uh, by uh, Cape Cod Five, uh, First Citizen Federal Credit Union, and Martha's Vineyard Savings. I also want to point out that our friends at Eight Cousins uh, also have copies of all our books. So I hope you uh, uh, you make sure that you um, uh, pay uh, pay some attention and and, get, and patronize our our friends at Eight Cousins. Um, as you know, with our format, if you've got a question on the bottom of your screen, um, uh, use the chat format and just type in your question, and then we'll 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 do that at the end. This is being recorded. Um, so I want you to be aware of that. Um, I'm very excited that this, this is a brand new book that just came out. And our guest tonight, Doug Swanson, was an investigative reporter at the Dallas Morning News. He's now teaching writing at the University of Pittsburgh. He was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And uh, he's got a new book out about uh, something we, I, I know we've all watched. Uh, uh, Chuck Norris is a Texas Ranger, and this has nothing to do with the baseball team, but uh, there's a lot of mythology and a lot of um, mistruths about that, and uh, and Mr. Swanson has, has delved deep into that. I'm pretty excited about this. Mr. Swanson, um, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Mark. Great to be with you. Or Is my audio okay? Everybody can hear me all right? Uh, all right, terrific. Um, why is a guy in Pittsburgh, that's me, uh, talking to people in Massachusetts or wherever you might be about a bunch of uh, law enforcement guys down in Texas? Well, uh, I'll try to explain that. Uh, first, I want to say we've had some power outages here in Pittsburgh. So if I vanish suddenly, that, that's probably what that means. Unless, of course, Chuck Norris has shown up and delivered a swift, swift kick to my head, which I thought he might want to do after the book came out. By the way, Chuck Norris, who was in Walker, Texas Ranger, uh, you know, no, no disrespect to Chuck Norris, but he could not really have been a Texas Ranger because he wore a black hat and had a beard. So that would have had him drummed out of the Rangers right away. But as Mark alluded to earlier, the, you know, the Rangers are one of the most famous law enforcement organizations in the world. I would put them up with Scotland Yard, uh, Royal Can Canadian Man of Police, the FBI. Uh, that, that sort of thing. Uh, they've been around longer than any state law enforcement organization in the United States, and they have this worldwide image. Uh, and that's what I'm going to explore a little bit uh, tonight, uh, how they got this image, what this image is. Uh, but I think we all have some idea of what a Texas Ranger is, uh, maybe from TV and movies, if nothing else. I mean, that was my first exposure to the Rangers as, as, a, as a kid. Growing up in Florida, I watched uh, this Disney show uh, called Texas John Slaughter. And uh, some of you may have seen that. The theme, theme song was uh, Texas John Slaughter made them do what they ought because if they didn't, they'd die. Uh, the Lone Ranger, of course, may be the most famous uh, of the uh, cinematic and, and uh, TV and radio Rangers. That started in 1933 uh, out of uh, WXYZ in Detroit. Uh, the script was originally called uh, Warren Lester, Manhunter, but then they changed it to Lone Ranger, which uh, uh, probably, I, I don't think if it was if it had stayed as Warren Lester, Manhunter, we'd, we'd still be talking about it today. But you know, the Rangers uh, have been in hundreds of movies. There have been hundreds of books written about them, hundreds of magazine and newspaper stories. Uh, and that's how the image was built. And I'll go into that a little, a little more as we... Uh, get further into this, but first I wanna just give a brief history of the Rangers and then talk about uh, why the Rangers, uh, the Texas Rangers have a resonance and have a, have a place in, in the conversation we're having now uh, nationally about police brutality and approaches to history and all, all this taking down of, of Confederate monuments, uh, the Rangers have a place in that too. So we'll talk about it at the end. Now I'm going to try to toggle here to some uh, some vintage photos. And this is the first time I've done this. I've told Mark that. So if I mess up, I'm sorry. I have my technical assistant uh, and my lovely wife here to the side to help me out if we mess up. 
uh, but I'm going to, to uh, try to pull up some photos here and do a, do a slideshow. Okay, I hope everybody's seeing that. Uh, can you give me a wave? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, this is uh, Lone Wolf Gonzalez, famous Texas Ranger back in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And as you can see, he was a very sharp dresser. He's got the, the, the custom boots on. Uh, Lone Wolf was, uh, by all accounts, a very good ranger. And, and we have to say, before we uh, really get rolling here, there are many rangers who were heroic, upright, honorable, courageous, valorous uh, individuals who performed a, a valuable public service in Texas. Uh, whether you agree or not, whether the Anglos uh, should have settled Texas, uh, setting that aside, uh, Texas would not be Texas without the Rangers. They were uh, an extraordinarily valuable force starting in 1823. Uh, so we have, to, we have to say that up front, that there were many really terrific people who were Rangers and continue to be. So I don't want this to be seen as an attack on the Rangers, but I want to, what I want to do is try to get behind the myth of the Rangers themselves. And, and Lone Wolf Gonzalez gives us a good example because, as I said, he was quite a good Ranger, but he was, he was quite concerned with his public image. Uh, the, there was a saying, I know you've heard this applied to other politicians, but there was no more dangerous place in Texas uh, than between Lone Wolf Gonzalez and a camera. He was... Uh, he was a Hollywood Ranger. Eventually, when he, when he finished being a Ranger, he rode off to Hollywood and became a consultant to TV shows. But Lone Wolf uh, uh, put forth his own public image. Uh, it was said that he killed 75 men as a Ranger. That was absolutely not true, but he, he never uh, disabused anyone of that. He claimed to be descended from Spanish royalty. Uh, that wasn't true either. He claimed to have fought in the, Mex in the Mexican army as a Mexican soldier. That wasn't true either. Uh, one time a reporter was uh, hanging out with him and they ended up spending the night together in a hotel. Nothing, I, I don't mean to imply there was anything strange going on. There was just no other rooms in this, in this uh, town where they were. And uh, the reporter woke up that morning and saw a lone wolf shaving. He was standing there at the shaving mirror with his hat on and his boots on and nothing else. And the lone wolf explained that that's what he did every morning. First thing, put on his hat and put on his boots. So that was lone wolf. But let's start at the beginning. Uh, the Rangers, first Rangers uh, came together in 1823 when the first Anglo settlers came into Texas. Uh, Stephen F. Austin led the first Anglo settlers into Texas. Uh, and that's, that's Stephen F. Austin right in the center of this painting here, which comes from, from the Library of Congress. And what he is doing here is urging settlers to go out and kill the Karakawa Indians. Karanko Indians were a coastal tribe uh, who had been in Texas for thousands of years, but they were very large, very muscular, very tall. They smeared alligator grease on themselves to uh, keep the mosquitoes off of them. They put uh, rattlesnake rattles in their hair, and they were said to be cannibals. So these were very fearsome Indians, and uh, the first time Stephen F. Austin saw them, he uh, recorded in his journal, these people must be exterminated. And what he is doing here is, is urging settlers to go out and exterminate these Indians. First rangers, the first 10 rangers, and really they were proto-rangers because they weren't formally recognized by any government at the time, were formed in 1823 to protect settlers against Caracua. This was when Texas was still a part of Mexico. They didn't really do any fighting against the Caracua. They uh, soon ran out of ammunition, and so they ran out of food, and they returned to their day jobs. But that was the beginning of the Rangers 197 years ago. And eventually the Kroaka were exterminated within about 10 years. So they, they couldn't put up much of a fight. They didn't have the ammunition or the population to fight the settlers and, and they, were, uh, they were long gone. Texas became uh, an independent republic in 1836 uh, and soon had to fight the Comanches. The Comanches from about 1750 to 1850 were the most powerful Indian tribe in North America. Uh, that's because they were the greatest horsemen in North America. And this is a George Caitlin uh, painting of Comanche horsemen. Uh, they were 
very clumsy on foot. They were short, squat, uh, weren't, uh, weren't very much good at anything. But when they got the horse, uh, they, uh, uh, people who would see them, white men who would see them, say that it was like watching a centaur. Uh, there was one beast, uh, Comanche and, and horse. And as you can see, this, uh, this Comanche down at the bottom of the frame, he's leaning down. And what the Comanches could do, they had a little strap that they would hold onto with, uh, with their foot. And they would lean down beneath the uh, neck of the horse and fire their arrows from there. And they could fire up to 30 arrows in a minute. So the, uh, the, the Anglo settlers at the time and the rangers were using single shot pistols and muskets. So they would fire and have to reload. And in that minute that it took them to reload, the, the Comanches would fill them with arrows. So it was, a, it was not an even fight at first. And the Comanches, uh, you know, the Comanches were called Lords of the Plains. And that's because they, they ruled the plains from Colorado down into Texas uh, for, for these many years. Now this is Jack Hayes, he was a ranger, a ranger captain. And Jack Hayes had a ranger company that uh, was one of the first companies in the American West to use the Colt revolving pistol. It was a five shot pistol that uh, Samuel Colt had developed and then gone broke. But uh, Jack Hayes and his company of rangers got hold of some of them and used them to fight the Comanches. And that's when the tide turned in the 1840s because no longer could the Comanches uh, wait for the rangers and others to uh, fire their one shot and then have to reload. Uh, so that began to turn the tide. And Jack Hayes is seen as one of the greatest uh, ranger captains of all times. He was, he was brave, he was fierce, he was a terrific tactician as well. And he also led some companies in the Mexican War. Mexican War was in 1846. Uh, the U.S. invaded Mexico uh, and the rangers went uh, and joined the army to help fight against Mexico. Now they were at that time uh, army soldiers, but they stayed as rangers. They stayed to themselves. They didn't dress as uh, as army soldiers, they stayed dressed as rangers. And I want to read you a brief passage from a book by a uh, New Englander, Samuel Chamberlain. It's called My Confession. Some of you may have read it. It's a terrific book. And uh, he was uh, from New Hampshire and Boston. And he encountered the rangers in, in the Mexican War. So he wrote, the rangers were the scouts of our army and a more reckless, devil may care looking set, it would be impossible to find this side of the infernal regions. Some wore buckskin shirts, black with grease and blood. Some wore red shirts, their trousers thrust into their high boots. All were armed with revolvers and huge bowie knives. Take them together with their uncouth costumes, bearded faces, lean and brawny forms, fierce wild eyes and swaggering manners. They were fit representatives of the outlaws which made up the population of the Lone Star State. Here's where the Rangers made their reputations in the Mexican War. Uh, because the Mexican War had a number of American war correspondents there recording what had happened. And they were just enamored of the Rangers, these swaggering uh, men who, who served as, as Chamberlain said, scouts in the army. Uh, and they, they saved a lot of American lives. They, they uh, kept uh, American soldiers from blundering into uh, ambushes. They uh, fought guerrilla warfare very effectively. Uh, and they were extraordinarily valuable to the U.S. Army. At the same time, uh, they were noted for their atrocities. Uh, they took no prisoners. Well, they took prisoners and then they killed them. Uh, they often uh, invaded villages and, and wiped out the civilians in the village uh, for no reason except revenge. And uh, Ulysses S. Grant, later president, but was then a lieutenant in the U.S. Army uh, in the Mexican War, wrote to his uh, wrote a letter to his uh, wife to be and he wrote about all of the texans seem to think it perfectly right to impose upon the people of a conquered city to any extent even to murder them where the act can be covered by the dark and how much they seem to enjoy acts of violence that was ulysses s grant the texan texas rangers in the, in the mexican war came to be known as los diablos tejanos the texas devils uh, and they wore that uh, as a badge of pride, and the Mexicans spat it as a curse. The Mexicans uh, feared the Rangers because of their fighting ability and their atrocities. Here's a, a, an engraving 
it shows uh, Samuel Walker, who's on the horse, uh, one of the more famous Texas Rangers fighting in the Mexican War. And this is the death of Samuel Walker in a village called Humatla in Mexico near the end of the war. That's not really how he died. He actually was shot, but this was a more dramatic rendering of him being uh, pierced with a lance. Uh, but uh, Walker was uh, one of the more deified rangers, and he also was instrumental in working with Samuel Colt in perfecting uh, the Colt revolver into a six-shooter, and it soon became you know, the gun that won the West. So Samuel Walker was, uh, was uh, a pioneer in that regard. He, he visited uh, Colt and, uh, and helped him work on this new gun. Go to post-war. Texas is now a state. This is the Jim Crow era. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it's before the Civil War, it's the 1850s. This is a cartoon that ran in uh, Harper's Magazine called Young Texas in Repose. And the, the figure on top is, is Texas with the uh, scars and the uh, sharp teeth and the knife. He's sitting on a slave who's been whipped, stabbed, shackled, abused. Texas was a slave state before the war. Texas, of course, bordered Mexico, uh, and the Underground Railroad in Texas ran south to Mexico. If you were a slave in Texas and you wanted to escape, you probably ran to Mexico. Very perilous journey, but you, once you got across the Rio Grande, you were free uh, because uh, slavery was illegal in Mexico at the time. So the Rangers, in some cases, uh, mounted slave hunting expeditions into Mexico. Uh, they would go in, try to seize the slaves, bring them back across the border and, and sell them in Texas. Uh, hence this, uh, this cartoon. Rangers did a lot of valuable things. They captured this outlaw, John Wesley Hardin, one of the great uh, uh, gunslingers of the Old West. Here's uh, John Wesley Hardin as a dead man. Uh, the Rangers didn't kill him. They put him in prison where he became a lawyer or learned to become a lawyer, got out and practiced law, and then was shot to death in El Paso uh, by either a dissatisfied client or a, a lover. No one's quite sure, but here he is as a dead man. But the Rangers were, were uh, instrumental in capturing a number of bad guys, including Hardin. So let's move to uh, the 20th century. 1912, 1913, 1914, 1915, along the Mexico border, down in what's called the Rio Grande Valley in Texas. This is a postcard that circulated at the time. The men on the horseback are rangers. As the legend says at the bottom, the men on the ground are dead Mexican bandits. The rangers were sent to South Texas at the time because uh, the border was a place of great violence and, uh, and uh, upheaval. There was a revolution going on in Mexico. At the same time, there was a land boom going on in Texas. So the rangers were sit down to keep the peace. What did that mean? Well, eventually it meant that the rangers, uh, depending upon your source, uh, killed hundreds or maybe thousands of Mexicans and Mexican Americans, including these four right here. Some of them were uh, bad guys, some of them were bandits. Uh, some of them, many of them, hundreds of them, were uh, only Mexicans or Mexican Americans who lived on land that the uh, white people wanted. So they sent the rangers in to force them off the land. Sometimes that meant just uh, scaring them. Sometimes that meant burning them out. Sometimes that meant killing them. Rangers uh, were known at this time as, uh, one New York journalist put it, common man killers. They operated what we now know as what we now call death squads. They had lists of people that, uh, that the Anglo power, powerful wanted dead. And so they went out and killed them. And this was at the point that, uh, that the Rangers became as feared uh, by Mexican Americans along the border as uh, the KKK uh, was feared in, in the Deep South by black people. Uh, they were a terror to these people. Now to the Anglo uh, power brokers who wanted this land, uh, they were a godsend. So it depended on which side you were on. But this is where the Rangers got their reputation as, as a, a force of uh, death along the uh, Mexican border. 
and that's a reputation that that has been impossible for them to shake and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, when we when we get to the end uh, here's a ranger company of uh, around the turn of the century this is what they looked like uh, you know well armed with the texas flag uh, flying in the background let's move to uh later in the in the early 20th century uh there were 450 lynchings in Texas from 1885 to 1930. Most of them of black men, uh, some of them of uh, Hispanic men and women. Uh, in 1919, which was known as the uh, Red Summer across the United States because of racial violence, uh, the Texas Rangers conspired with uh, police chiefs and sheriffs in Texas at the governor's orders to uh, quash the civil rights of black people. They uh, conspired to keep them from voting. They conspired to keep them from meeting to uh, pursue their civil rights. They blocked their mail. They instructed uh, local gun shop owners not to sell them weapons. They infiltrated their meetings. It was all aimed at keeping uh, black citizens in Texas from exercising their civil rights. Uh, this picture is from 1930 in Sherman, Texas. And the black man in shackles was named George Hughes. Uh, he was accused of assaulting, sexually assaulting a white woman. So he went to trial. And this is him uh, being led to, uh, to the courthouse, from the jail to the courthouse for the first day of his trial for assault. The Rangers were brought in to protect him, four Rangers. Now you may have heard the slogan, one Ranger, one riot. Uh, this was supposedly said by a ranger who showed up one day uh, when there was a riot going on and the, and the local law enforcement official said, there's only one of you. And the ranger allegedly said, well, hell, you've only got one riot, don't you? Well, that's not true. That never happened. But uh, there are a number of uh, statues and signs and monuments around Texas that uh, have this slogan, one riot, one ranger on them. So I decided to take a look at this one riot. Here's what happened. George Smith is on trial for assaulting the white woman, first day of trial. Four rangers are there to protect him. This is in Sherman, Texas, a little farm town then uh, north of Dallas. A mob formed outside the courthouse, a mob of white people, and they decided to storm the courthouse to get George Hughes. They got up to the second floor, which was where the trial was taking place. The rangers fired some shotgun shotgun shot at them and the mob retreated. Uh, the rangers thought they had it done. They thought they had it fixed. But then the, re the uh, mob set fire to the courthouse. The rangers locked George Hughes in a vault on the second floor to try to protect him. The courthouse was ablaze. Uh, the rangers climbed out the second floor window of the courthouse, got in a borrowed car and left town. The mob waited till the, the fire burned out they got George Hughes out from the vault, threw his body out the second floor window, dragged it through the streets behind a car, uh, and hoisted it uh, from a tree limb on a noose uh, in the black part of town and set it on fire. So that was your uh, one riot, one ranger. Uh, and this is indicative of the, of the ranger's problematic history with race. But here's, here's one of the best examples. And we'll go back to this one uh, a little later, but this is 1956. A uh, man leaning up against a tree is a ranger named Jay Banks. He was sent to a little town called Mansfield, Texas, which is between Dallas and Fort Worth, because the NAACP, uh, after Brown versus Board of Education, wanted to integrate Texas schools, which were all white, Texas public schools, and they chose Mansfield as a place to start. This was Mansfield High School. They were armed with a court order, uh, ordering local officials to uh, enroll black students. So the governor sent in the Rangers, keep the peace. Now, what does that mean? I know you've all seen pictures, or, and, and maybe you, uh, like me, you're old enough to remember when in places like Arkansas and Mississippi, federal troops and the National Guard were, uh, were deployed to uh, make sure that black students could enroll. We've seen uh, the photographs and the famous Norman Rockwell painting of a black student being uh, led past spitting and yelling mobs to enroll in school. 
Uh, the Rangers weren't there for that. The Rangers were there to keep black children out of the school. You see on the figure on the high school uh, to the left of the Ranger, there's a figure hanging from a noose. That's a uh, black figure hanging in effigy over the school. A mob formed uh, outside the school carrying signs that said black children must die, uh, kill all blacks. It didn't say blacks. You can imagine what it said. But again, the Rangers under governor's orders were there to not to, to prohibit, they were there to prohibit black students from enrolling. Uh, they sided with the mob. And Jay Banks, because of that, here in Mansfield and a week later in, in Texarkana, Texas, uh, and because of this photograph, which circulated worldwide, this was a United Press photograph, became the face of the uh, uh, opposition to integration in Texas. This photograph ran in newspapers all over the country. We'll get back to that in a minute. A couple more things to talk about, and then we'll and then we'll just deal with the Rangers in general. This is uh, Captain Alfred Alley, uh, who was a distinguished Ranger in South Texas, a Ranger for life, was one of the toughest Rangers ever. How do I know he was one of the toughest Rangers ever? Well, when a uh, Texas Highway Patrolman wrote uh, Captain Alley's wife a traffic ticket for a burnout taillight. Ali went in to uh, the, see the highway patrolman, confronted him about it. And uh, the highway patrolman said that Ali's wife was lying. So Ali took out his pistol and pistol whipped the highway patrolman. That was Ali's tactic. He would, uh, he would pistol whip or he would slap you. Uh, that was how he handled people he didn't like. Well, in uh, 1967, there was a farm worker strike in South Texas. The farm workers were Hispanic. They were paid maybe 50 cents an hour to pick melons. Uh, they lived in shacks. They had no medical care uh, to get water in the fields. They had to bend down and drink the puddles uh, from the ground. Uh, so they struck. Uh, they were aligning themselves with uh, Cesar Chavez's forces out of California. And the uh, melon growers asked uh, the governor to send in the rangers, and he did. He brought in the rangers under Captain Ali, who you see here. And they broke the strike by harassing the strike breakers by beating them, by arresting them for no reason, by uh, holding their faces inches from uh, speeding freight trains that were barreling through town. Uh, and they were successful. The Rangers were, uh, were uh, strike breakers in many cases. They broke uh, steel workers strikes. They broke coal miners strikes. Uh, they even at one point broke a cowboy strike up in the panhandle of Texas. This was one of the most famous in 1967, led by Captain Ali. And later, the federal courts and the Supreme Court and some uh, findings from the Civil Rights Commission censored Captain Ali for this. And, out, and you know, Ali's defense, he was just a man out of his past. Uh, he, he once said, these doggone civil rights, that's the damnedest thing I ever heard of. He was an old school ranger. When he retired, uh, he was hailed as one of the greatest ranger captains ever. He settled back in his uh, hometown in South Texas. And uh, one day he went to the store to buy a jug of water. Uh, the young Hispanic clerk uh, rang up a price of $1.75. Uh, Captain Ali thought it should be $1.45. So he uh, slapped the uh, clerk and pulled his pistol on him. It was uh, Captain Ali to the end. One more Ranger anecdote. This is uh, Henry Lee Lucas, who was at one time the most famous serial killer in American history. This was in the uh, late 1970s, mid 1980s. He supposedly killed perhaps 300 people across the United States. Uh, now this was a guy, he only had uh, one good eye, his right eye, he had, a, uh, had an IQ of about 85. He had a fifth grade education. Uh, yet he was able to go all over the country, killing hundreds of people, never leaving a single clue. Not a fingerprint, not a hair, not a shell casing that could be matched to him, not a tire track, uh, nothing. Not a witness, ever. Uh, but the Rangers had him in captivity, and he began confessing to these crimes. Uh, 
police officers would come in from all over the country uh, and Lucas would confess to unsolved murders. So they would clear these murders. And every time he would clear a murder, confess to a crime, uh, the Rangers would put a pin in their map and you can see the pins all over the map there. And really they ran literally from coast to coast, from Texas to Canada, from California to New England. Uh, between 200 and 300 murders, this man confessed to killing, uh, to people he confessed to killing. Uh, the murders were uh, attributed to him. And the Rangers had uh, the deadliest, most dangerous man in America in captivity. They were very proud of that. And, uh, you know, a lot of the Rangers got a lot of glory out of that. Well, in 1985, uh, a Dallas newspaper, the Dallas Times Herald, uh, ran an expose and showed that Lucas could not have committed uh, these murders. He may have committed three of them, his mother, his common law wife, and a woman he worked for at one point. But the newspaper proved, and later evidence proved, that he could not have been in these places when he claimed to have committed these murders. And what later came out was that uh, he was allowed to see the files on these murders before he confessed to them. So that's how he knew to say, yes, I killed this woman in this place. Yes, I used a knife or yes, I used a gun. Uh, but it was all a hoax. It was a monstrous hoax. Uh, and when this was exposed, the Rangers said, well, we didn't know it was a hoax. Uh, all we did was make Lewis available. We didn't investigate his whereabouts. We were just making, we were just his custodian. We couldn't have known that he was lying. We didn't, we didn't probe his whereabouts, his background, anything like that. And that was the Rangers, uh, uh, that's what the Rangers said. Well, when I was researching this book, uh, I found the Rangers' Henry Lee Lucas records in the state archives, and no one had ever looked at them. What I found in those archives was proof that the Rangers were lying. They did know that it was all a hoax. They did know that Lucas could not have committed these, crime, committed these crimes. They had an extensive investigation into his whereabouts, and they knew that it was impossible that he killed someone in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, when he was living in Maryland, or that he killed someone in uh, Baytown, Texas, uh, when he was working in Jacksonville, Florida. They knew all this, but they kept it secret. Why? I don't know. Uh, I think it was because they didn't want to admit that this was a hoax. They didn't want to admit that they had played along. But here's the problem with that, beyond it being a, an abdication of public responsibility. Every time a murder was cleared, every time a murder was attributed to Henry Lee Lucas, the investigation stopped. So that means that these 200 plus murders that he confessed to, for dozens of years, while uh, Lucas was believed to be the suspect, no one was looking into these cases. These killers were walking free and, and the Rangers allowed that to happen. Uh, well, there's the book. Uh, so uh, a couple of things I wanna add and then we'll go to questions. Uh, remember the, the photo of Jay Banks leaning against uh, the tree in front of the high school uh, where the black effigy was hanging. Uh, Jay Banks was the model for a statue of a Texas Ranger that was completed in 1960. Why was Jay Banks the model? Because Jay Banks was a good looking guy. The, the sculptor said he looked like a Ranger. Uh, so this sculpture, this statue was made. It was uh, 12, feet high on its base. Uh, the base said, by the way, one riot, one ranger. And the statue itself was uh, placed in the early 1960s in the lobby of Love Field Airport in Dallas, which is the main city airport in Dallas. Uh, it's the equivalent of, I guess, Midway Airport in, in Chicago. There's DFW Airport, but there's also Love Field Airport. It's the home base for Southwest Airlines. Uh, and it stood in the lobby of uh, Dallas Love Field for uh, since on and off since the early 1960s. Now, as you can see by looking at my picture, I'm, a, I'm an old white guy, so I never paid much attention to that, that statue. But, you know, let's remember that Jay Banks was the uh, face of official opposition to integration of Texas schools in the 1950s. 
how would you feel if you were an African American uh, getting off a plane in Dallas? And that's, uh, that's one of the first things you see is this statue of Jay Banks. Uh, you know, maybe your parents or your grandparents couldn't enroll in a school in Texas because of, uh, of what the Rangers were doing. So within days of the book, my book coming out, uh, the city of Dallas took down this statue of Jay Banks, hauled it away. I don't know where it is now, uh, but they were, uh, they were alarmed at, at the message that the statue may have sent. Uh, and this was at the same time, a lot of Confederate statues and statues of Columbus were coming down across the South and across the nation. And at the same time, as you recall, we were having, and we're still having, a debate about uh, police brutality. Uh, going back to the, what the Rangers did along the border in the early parts of, of the 20th century, uh, you know, I've said before, the Rangers didn't invent police brutality, but, but they perfected it along the border. They, they, they were uh, very rabid, effective practitioners of police brutality uh, for a long time. And so this has become part of the discussion now, uh, there even have been suggestions that uh, the Texas Rangers baseball team should change its name. Uh, there's a columnist from the Washington Post who said that, uh, columnist from the Chicago Tribune, uh, the Texas Rangers baseball team is having none of it. But there are many discussions uh, taking place at museums across the state and elsewhere uh, that uh, glorify the Rangers and don't take into account the histories of Hispanics, Blacks, Native Americans. Uh, and, and I think it's really important as the Rangers come up on their 200th anniversary in, uh, in 2023. And then since this is Texas, there's gonna be a lot of pageantry and celebration. I think it's really important that, that the Rangers face up to their history. Uh, and for many years, uh, their image has been promulgated by this propaganda factory that they have operated. And you know, all these TV shows that we saw about the Rangers in the 50s and 60s, if, if the producers wanted cooperation from the Rangers, uh, they had to get script approval. And so the Rangers only approved scripts that uh, show the Rangers uh, in, in a very flattering way. Now, I think it's really important uh, as we're approaching this 200th anniversary uh, for the Rangers to acknowledge uh, the other side of their history. Yeah, let's talk about the honor and the courage and all the good things they've done. But let's talk too about the history of Hispanics and Blacks as it relates to the Rangers and Native Americans and other people. I think it's really important to do for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, one, to, it's fairer. Uh, one, to give voice to those who, who haven't had a lot of voice here. And I think it makes the Rangers uh, appear stronger as an institution. Uh, I don't think it diminishes them at all. If, if we start talking about, for example, the Civil War and slavery and, and really facing up to what happened, uh, does that make us weaker as a nation? No, I think it makes us a lot stronger. Same with the Rangers. So I hope, I hope they take this opportunity to, uh, to do that. Uh, you know, they're not sharing their plans with me at this point because they, they weren't all that happy with the book in many ways, but uh, I hope that's what happens. So that's my history. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Doug. That was awesome. Um, I, my, my son's sitting here with me. We're both sitting here wide mouth, particularly when you mention about, uh, you know, bringing faces of people within inches of speeding trains. Um, um, as I'm listening to you, and anybody who knows me knows that I, love following all the stories of World War II, but they, these clearly sound like Third Reich-esque tactics, you know, that the, the things that we would, that we almost take for granted that would never happen here in the United States, so, you know, that what happened before, you know, be it a Cossack, be it a, 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 a Stalin-esque thing, and yet, uh, you know, you just had a whole litany of things that, that went on um, going back from, you know, literally from Stephen F. Austin in that time to exterminating Indians to through the Mexican War, through the evolution of the Colt Revolver. Um, obviously, I think, you know, it may be completely inadvertent for, for, for your point, you know, that for um, in terms of uh, 
how this happened, but obviously given that all the tactics and, 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 and uh, um, that, that were used and the conversations that are going on today, um, how, you just mentioned that you, you think that the, um, uh, they really have to come forth and, um, and, and fess up to their past. Do you think that's possible? Do you, do you think that they will be able to do that? Well, that's a great question. And, and I think to, to, to preface it, I think we have to be, uh, we have to beware of, of what's called presentism, you know, the, judging uh, the acts of someone uh, 200 years ago by our present standards. Uh, you know, we have to acknowledge that, that Texas in the 1800s and even in the 1900s was a wild and violent place and, and the rangers were reacting to that uh so you know it was it was tough men in a tough time so that that has to be acknowledged in this discussion uh but uh you know the there is no doubt that the rangers were for much of their existence uh acting under orders from and on behalf of uh the white anglo power structure in Texas. And if that meant wiping out Indians and Mexicans and, and, uh, and quashing the civil rights of blacks and, and looking the other way when, when uh, people were lynched, well, that's, that's what they were there to do and that's what they were told to do. Do I think they will acknowledge that? You know, I'm, I'm a little bit hopeful. And the reason I'm hopeful is because you know, I, I'm starting to hear from those who are the, the custodians of Ranger, the official custodians of Ranger history. And I can't, I can't be any more specific than that at this point because it's, it's, uh, I think it's not ready to be released yet. I'm hope, hopeful, that, hopeful that it will be soon. But I, I think they're, they're seeing the pressure. I think, I think they're feeling the pressure a little bit. And, and uh, you know, the, another reason I'm hopeful, there's, there's a Texas State, State Texas History Museum in Austin called the Bullock Museum. And a few years ago, they put up an exhibit of uh, violence along the border. And it was very graphic and it, and it, it uh, explained the Rangers role and the, and the role of others. Uh, and and that, was a, that was a real sea change. So I'm, I'm hoping we see more of that. Uh, and I, th I think the Rangers and, and those who have been uh, the custodians of their image are, are gonna realize they're out of step at some point. And you know, Texas is, is becoming a majority minority state uh, and, uh, you know, I think the citizens are going to insist on that. Uh, and, and I think, you know, the national climate, uh, it brings that to bear as well. We're, we're, we're revisiting, revisiting this all, all over the country, uh, except maybe parts of the deep South. And, and I, and I'm from the deep South. So I, you know, I, I, I can acknowledge that, uh, it's, it's happening. It's happening slowly. I mean, I, I, this is a little bit of a, of a, of a switch, but it, just to give you an example, sir, a, a different metric here. There, there have never been many Texas Rangers, and right now there are only about 160 Texas Rangers in the state of Texas. This is a state of 30 million people. Most people in Texas have never seen a Ranger, uh, despite the large image. So 160 Rangers. Uh, four of them are women, eight of them are black, and 34 of them are Hispanic. Uh, there weren't, they didn't have any women rangers until 1993. They didn't have any black rangers until 1988. And that was only after an NAACP complaint. Uh, so it's changing, but it's changing slowly and it's tardy. Uh, and, and, you know, we would like to see a little far further along, but it is changing. So it's a long answer to your question to say, yes, I'm hopeful. What, would I bet on it? No, probably not. How, how cooperative were they, were, were, were Texas Rangers the, you know, you mentioned about the kind of the keepers of the flame there. Uh, how cooperative were they with you in researching this? And how long did it take you to research this, compile this, put this all together? Uh, individual Rangers were cooperative with me. And, and you know, individual Rangers operate often independently. It's, it's a, there's a very, uh, prominent lack of bureaucracy within the Rangers. The, the, the individual Ranger pretty much does what he thinks he needs to do. So I, for example, I spent the day with a Ranger named Brandon Best down in, uh, in Southeast Texas. Great guy, uh, you know, terrific Ranger, terrific lawman, 
and a credit to the agency, all of that. Uh, now the Rangers officials uh, would not cooperate with me at all. I, I spent, uh, the, the book took five years to research and write. And I spent all five of those years trying to get some cooperation out of the Rangers officials, uh, emails, phone calls, letters, personal appeals, all of that, nothing worked. Uh, they wanted nothing to do with me. And uh, the only comment they've had on the book so far is that uh, historians will judge its veracity. So, you know, I guess I'll leave myself to the judgment of historians. They, they have not uh, said anything else. Uh, you know, the, 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 the Rangers are under now, I mean, they're, they're a professional operation now, don't get me wrong. The Rangers have changed dramatically. Uh, they, they have standards and training and uh, they are a professional law enforcement organization uh, and a really good one in many ways. Uh, but the Rangers are under what's called the Texas Department of Public Safety. And that, that agency is not known for its transparency uh, and uh, with me or any other journalist. Uh, so it's a problem. I'd, I'd sure like to see more transparency, but uh, I'm, I'm not too optimistic about that. You clearly told us some anecdotes about some individuals and some activities. Were there things that you found in your research that you just simply could not put in the book? I mean, either just, they were just too heinous, just too, you couldn't verify. I mean, just things that you, you, you had a like, whoa moment of it. Was like, whoa. I'm not sure I could touch this one. Or. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a photograph. You know, I mentioned that we had the photo of George Hughes being uh, led to, uh, to his court date in chains. And there's a photograph of his corpse, his charred corpse hanging from a tree that I have, and I couldn't put that in the book. It wasn't that, uh, that there were terrible incidents, it was just there were so many of them uh, that you know, at, at some point you just have to say as a writer, you have to say, I mean, can I put another atrocity in here? And you know, am I piling on too much? Now again, it needs to be said, there were atrocities on both sides. For, for example, the Comanche Indians uh, were, were notorious for torturing uh, Anglo settlers. Uh, and, and there were atrocities by the, by the Mexican forces in the, in the Mexican War. So it's, it wasn't one-sided. But to, to more answer your question more directly, it was more a matter of volume than, than individual incidents. I mean, I could have gone on and on and on and on and talking about uh, executions and atrocities and, and war crimes. And, and at some point, you just have to say, I hope I've made my point and, uh, and move on to the next one. We've got some questions coming in here. Um, uh, this is from someone in the audience. First, as a fellow Floridian, I appreciate your work on this issue. Question, there's been a long history of quote unquote night riding in the South as a tool for enforcing white supremacy in the antebellum period through reconstruction, redemption, as well as into the 20th century. There's a lot of evidence that many of the people involved were public officials, including police, police officers by day and violent vigilantes by night. I was wondering if you could talk about the links between the Rangers who function largely as state actors with a history of extrajudicial activities of organized white violence throughout the South. For example, do you have a sense that the history of the Rangers helped legitimize or valorize the behavior of other officials throughout Texas and the rest of the South? Sure, and, and it was no secret that, uh, that in the 1920s, 1930s, uh, there were many of the Rangers who were members of the KKK. Uh, there were, not, as these, excuse me, Night Riders were, were uh, also called white cappers uh, in Texas. And, uh, you know, every now and then the Rangers would arrest a few of them. Uh, every now and then the Rangers would move in and, and uh, arrest uh, some people who had been involved in racial disturbances, white people, uh, but they rarely went to trial. Uh, the, the, it's, it was extremely rare for someone who was involved in a, in a lynching uh, to be prosecuted. Uh, uh, going back to that Sherman lynching where the, where the mob burned down the courthouse, I think the Rangers ended up arresting nine people there. Uh, only one of them actually went to trial uh, and he was convicted of arson. He served a very uh, brief sentence. So it, it, if we're looking at the period of the 1920s, 1930s, uh, when, when racial violence, 19, you know, 1919, 1910s, uh, when racial violence was uh, across Texas and across the South, uh, the Rangers did very little to stop it. Yes, it's true that, that 
many of the night riders were law enforcement officials. Uh, I mean, it was it was a terrible time, uh, and and law enforcement was complicit, and the Rangers were hand in hand with that. And, you know, at one point, uh, the director, national director of the NAACP, John Shalady, a white man, came to Texas to try to talk to the governor about racial violence, uh, violence against black people in Texas. Uh, you know, we saying we want some protection. Uh, and the, rain, the, the governor refused to see him. He was in Austin. Uh, he, he saw the Rangers, uh, not the top Ranger, but the second in command, the assistant adjutant general. Uh, and Shalady asked for protection because he believed his life was in danger. Again, Shalady was a white man, but he was head of the NAACP. But he said, I, I feel I'm in danger here in Austin. Uh, can you help protect me? And the, and the uh, assistant adjutant general refused. Uh, Shalady walked out onto the streets of Austin where he was accost accosted by uh, three public officials who beat him savagely on the streets of Austin and put him on a train to St. Louis and told him never come back to Texas again. These were public officials. They were not prosecuted. They were in fact hailed as heroes in Texas. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's the way it worked. Um, were the Rangers um, an active military unit during the Civil War? And if so, were they, did they stay together? Were they? Uh, there were some, uh, some Rangers who uh, became Confederate soldiers. There's one particularly famous unit called Terry's Texas Rangers, but they were, they were part of the Confederate Army. Then there were other Rangers who controlled uh, the frontier, and they were, I guess I would call them quasi-Rangers at the time. And their, their purpose was to uh, protect settlers against Indian attacks. But in general, the Rangers were dormant during the Civil War and, and in the era uh, right after the Civil War, the, the Jim Crow era. And the Rangers really only reformed as an official unit in the 1870s. What made you undertake this project? And when you did, um, did you have a pretty good idea of what was going on or were you surprised at what you were finding? I, I took the project. I've been carrying the idea around in my head for a long time. I mean, I was a newspaper reporter at the Dallas Morning News for uh, more than 30 years. And I'd been planning to do a story about the Rangers and never really got around to it. Uh, so I had written a, another book about a Texas character named Benny Binion, who was a racketeer. And then he moved to Las Vegas and started the World Series of Poker. After I wrote that, my, my publisher, Viking, said, we want a, a big Texas book. And so I thought, well, you know, what's after the Alamo, what's bigger than the Rangers? So I, I set about thinking I was just going to do a, a comprehensive history of the Rangers, uh, thinking it would take me a couple of years. I, I badly underestimated the amount of material I was going to have to go through. But what I also found is I started poking around uh, what was, I found the stories behind the myths. And, you know, a lot of the myths just, began to fall apart right away as soon as I began poking into them. And, and, and I want to say there have been many other scholars who've, who've written about the Rangers' uh, atrocities on the border or in the Mexican War uh, or, or elsewhere. Uh, and I wasn't, in, in a lot of cases, the first to get there. But in, in the other cases, it had been done in, in a fairly discreet way. I mean, they, they had written about one small uh, piece of history or you know one one geographical uh, part of Texas or, or something like that. So I, I what I wanted to do was put it all together across the nearly 200 years and and see what it looked like you know as a as a whole here. And that that as I began assembling that whole, that's what surprised me how how every time every era when I looked at what the Rangers had done. And again you know they did a lot of good. I have to keep saying that, uh, but. Once you start looking behind the legends and taking the myths apart, uh, you know, some very bad stories begin to emerge. And I, I began to see how the Rangers uh, uh, again and again covered them up. And then not only covered them up, but took these, these uh, terrible uh, events and incidents and, and uh, remanufactured them, uh, transformed them into uh, stories of heroism. It was, it was uncanny. Uh, and and really surprising to me. So that's one reason that it took me uh, five years to, to pull all this together. How has this been received in Texas? I mean, besides the fact they took down that statue, how uh, what's the reception <laughs> been? 
Well, I, uh, because of COVID-19, and I'm here in Pittsburgh, I haven't been back to Texas yet, so I don't know if I'll be shot if I try to cross <laughs> the line. I mean, I'm, it, it's, I, I'm getting lots of support, getting lots of really good emails. The reviews have been great. The, you know, the sales have been good. At the same time, I mean, all I have to do is go on the, the books page on Amazon.com, and, and there's plenty of people lining up to tell me, well, you know, what an idiot I am and, uh, uh, and all of that. I mean, you know, I'm not a real Texan, and someone wrote the other day that I hate Texans, which will come as a surprise to my wife and two children who were all born in Texas. But, uh, you know, I spent half my life in Texas. But I would say on the whole uh, – more than on the whole, the, the, the reception has been very good. And, and the, the newspaper and radio coverage and, and all of that has been very encouraging. I think, I think it, uh, it, it taps into a recognition that, that many people in Texas and elsewhere have uh, that, that it's time to look at this. Now, there are some who, who don't want to talk about this. They, they do not want to examine the myths. They do not want to examine the legends, you know, and I'm, I'm dismissed as yet just another, as, as yet another woke liberal who wants to just, you know, uh, poke holes in, in heroes. And, and, you know, that's, that's not the case. What I wanted to do was, as I said earlier, is try, try to tell the whole story, uh, because I think, I think that's really important. And as a writer, uh, you know, that's far more interesting to me. Um. Well, and if you're ever worried about your ego, you always have the internet. Trust me. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's you, you never get too full of yourself. There's always uh, the internet will always make sure you're, you're you get that. Um, in the song Texas Rangers, the protagonist said he joined at age 16. Is that realistic? Were there any requirements to join? I'm sorry. The first part of that question was in the song Texas Rangers. Oh. The protagonist says he joined at age 16. Is that realistic? Were there any requirements to join? Uh, oh, yes, that's realistic. In, in the early days of the Rangers, there were some as young as 14 or 15. Uh, and, and it often, uh, and it was a very loose organization then. I mean, you know, if you knew the captain, uh, if you were a good horseman, if you were a, a good shot, uh, if you just uh, wanted to go out and fight people, chase Indians, if you, uh, if you were immune to danger, yeah, you could be a Ranger. Uh, certainly, uh, there were very young rangers at, at the time. I mean, there were some older rangers too, uh, but uh, you know, that, that's about all the requirements uh, that were in place uh, for many, many years. And it was only until the 1930s, the mid-1930s, that, uh, that the rangers began to uh, uh, adopt standards and requirements and, uh, and, and training uh, to make the rangers into a professional force. Before that, it was uh, if you were in the right place at the right time and if you knew the right people and, uh, you know, if you wanted to work for low pay and, and, and bad conditions, uh, but have the, the title of Ranger, then you were there. Well, I don't think you're a woke liberal. I think you've done a great piece of research and, and history. So I applaud you for this. I, I'm, um, I, I have this on order. I, I'm going to find this a fascinating read. I've been looking forward to this one. And uh, uh, I want to thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank, thank you for taking the time. Thank your wife for being the uh, the, the technical advisor behind the scenes. <laughs> um, so thank you. Good luck with this book. Uh, I know it's already on the bestseller list, so you don't need my good wishes, but good luck with this. Thank you for joining us. I want to thank everyone else for, uh, for being in the audience tonight. Um, stay healthy, stay safe. Mark, can I say, if anyone has any sure. questions, uh, email me at dougjswanson at gmail.com. I'm happy to talk about the book or Rangers or help you look up records. If you, if you think your ancestor might be a ranger, you know, feel free to drop me an email. All right. What's, what was that again? The, what's the email address? Doug J. Swanson at gmail.com. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Good luck with this book and uh, stay safe. Good night. Uh, Mr. Swanson, thank you so very, very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Great to be with you. Good night, everybody.